Well, it seems like every great organization has at least one motivating person behind it. And for the Peterson Automotive Museum, that person was Robert E. Peterson, who was a local Southern California man, born and raised near Los Angeles, who founded a publishing empire beginning in 1948. He started out at MGM Studios when he was probably 18 or 19 during the war, World War II. And in those days, the veteran publicists were of draft age and they were all drafted into World War II. So the deal was that if you were drafted, you would get your job back when the war was over. So in the meantime, they hired a lot of very young people like Mr. Peterson. He started out as a messenger and then he got into the publicity department. He finally went into the Army Air Corps. There was no Air Force at the time. And he never saw duty overseas, he was just stateside. The interesting thing is they gave him a camera and they said, you're gonna go up and photograph reconnaissance pictures. So that's how he became a photographer. And then the war ended and he got mustered out in about 46. So he went back to MGM and they said, we're very sorry, but we don't have a job for you because the other guys had come back. So he and a buddy that were, they were all messengers and people from MGM, he and a man named Bob Lindsay, got interested in the idea of cars. And all of a sudden, all these GIs come back and they have all this pay that's been accruing in their little bank accounts and they all want to buy a car. They started a company called Hollywood Publicity Associates. So they got their first assignment was to publicize a car show at the Los Angeles Armory, which no longer exists. So they got this hot rod show and then they decided that they would create a little pamphlet that talked about what these cars were that you were gonna see at the car show. This is 1947. So 1948, they thought, wow, this is something we could publicize and you know, maybe we, there's so many people coming to see these cars, maybe we should start a magazine. That's what they did. 1948, first issue of Hot Rod Magazine in January, 1948. The Hot Rod hobby had no better friend than Robert E. Peterson, who founded Hot Rod Magazine in 1948. A year later, he founded Motor Trend Magazine, and the rest, as they say, is history. After that, more than two dozen magazines of all kinds, for all interests, were part of Mr. Peterson's publishing empire. Today, he's one of the best remembered hot rod enthusiasts, not only for his passion, but for his desire to build an automotive museum, to teach people what came to be, how it came to be, and to celebrate the automotive culture that he helped found. Robert E. Peterson was a household name because he was the publisher of Hot Rod Magazine. And I grew up in Hollywood, and the first subscription I had was Hot Rod Magazine, and that impacted my life in a very big way. For me, Pete was otherworldly. He was involved in so many aspects of life that I admired and had such an impact on me that that kind of drew us together. And then as time went on, we continued to evolve through the automobile, but our friendships and our social lives were primary, and I just loved being with him. We, we fl flew globally with him, uh, we spent a lot of time together, and it was all joyous. He was a very special guy. You know, like most sales guys, I met Mr. Peterson 
at, uh, at an event. And back in those days, Peterson Publishing had some of the finest suites at all the major racetracks across the country. And our job as salespeople was to entertain our customers there. And for the bigger races, Mr. Peterson would come to town uh, and be there to, uh, I, I don't want to say hold court because he wasn't that kind of guy. Despite his wealth and stature, he was just a regular guy. And I believe I met him uh, for the first time at our suite in Daytona, which was uh, just a kind of a passing. And it was, uh, it was a big deal to me because he was you know, a guy that I really admired, knowing that he had started my favorite magazine, which I now work for, which was, you know, also a big deal. He and I really started talking more often uh, about uh, the museum uh, when the subject of the, the company's photo archives came up because I had moved repeatedly to protect the archives to make sure that nothing happened to them. And I had interest uh, in making sure that nothing ever did happen to him uh, because of all the corporate changes. The last time I had lunch with him actually was about uh, the archives and moving it to the museum. Having decided to build an automotive museum, Mr. Peterson now had to find a place to put it. Well, one of the buildings he briefly considered when he was moving his publishing empire was this building, an entire city block on the corner of Wilshire and Fairfax that used to be an Orbach's department store. Mr. Peterson said this would make a great automotive museum. It's three stories, it's a robust building, you can fill it full of cars and not worry about it, and it has an attached thousand car parking structure. He's just a wonderful guy, and Mrs. Peterson and I became great friends, and she and I did a lot of crazy things together. We used to do the interior decorating of all of the sales office buildings. Uh, we also had suites at the various arenas in Detroit, Joe Louis Stadium, and uh, we did things like that. Between the two of them, Mr. and Mrs. Peterson and myself, we were kind of a little troika. <laughs> But Mr. Peterson, he was such a great guy, and Mrs. Peterson was so wonderful. I mean, it, you know, why would I ever want to leave two people that I really enjoyed being with? We worked hard, believe me, there were 12-hour days. I just loved what I did. I loved my work, I loved the people that I was involved with. I thought it was a great industry to be involved in, and I still do. Mr. Peterson used to uh, have a saying, you could cor correct somebody's writing but you couldn't teach him the passion uh, that went behind it. So when we hired uh, writers or salespeople or photographers or anybody that we looked to hire, we hired people who were passionate about the industry and really loved it. It made it a very, very special place because we all shared that bond. If Margie and Pete walked through the doors today, they would be beaming with pride because they recognized talent and they were very good at delegating to people that could produce. And I don't think in their wildest dreams they would ever expect to see what we have today. And that makes me exceptionally proud and proud for them. Pebble Beach Concord d'Elegance began in 1950 uh, with the introduction of the Pebble Beach Road Races. This was a street race through the, uh, the winding roads of Pebble Beach, dodging the trees along the side of the road and, and seeing if you can get down, uh, can get down the avenue uh, more quickly than anybody else. Well, 
in conjunction with the road race, there, there happened to be a little car show called Concours d'Elegance. Now that Concours d'Elegance just means competition of elegance. The race was something that you would, you would go to and you would watch and you would follow if you were a genuine gearhead, if you had um, motor oil going through your veins, if you're really interested in competition, but it kind of left out uh, a, a larger segment of the population, not the least of which was the ladies and some gentlemen who just weren't interested in, in, in racing, but did appreciate beauty. It had this, this fabulous oceanfront location with a marvelous golf course in front of it with a lot of natural landscaping. It had a rugged shore. It had everything that a European concourse had going for it. it had a, again, it had a marvelous hotel. It had a, a place to show off the cars and it was in a very nice part of the state, a very expensive part of the state where the, where the elite would meet. In a way, it harkens to the European Concours, which frequently were at seaside resorts or, or famous hotels or other parts of France or the French Riviera or other uh, parts of Europe that were especially um, beautiful. Uh, were especially wealthy and uh, attracted moneyed people with good taste. For me, the Concours d'Elegance really came into its own after the end of the races. Uh, the races, of course, ran from 1950 to 1956, and uh, in 1957 they held a Pebble Beach road race at the new Laguna Seca track, but the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance, which of course was set up simply as an adjunct to the road races to show off some of the cars of the road races and also to show some antique cars that some of the people involved in the races had collected, went on even though the races were not there. And it was interesting because it was clear then that already there was an audience for this kind of a car show. The first uh, Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance, like many other such shows in the U.S., grew up out of a combination of the vintage car, the veteran car scene in the US where people had antique cars from the turn of the 20th century that they liked to polish, display, and show, as well as the new cars that were coming in, especially the new cars from Europe, custom-bodied cars and sports cars. And uh, much like the traditional pre-war French Concours d'Elegance and the ones held in Italy, the Concorso d'Elegance in Italy, they showcased the finest new work of both couturiers and the car designers and builders. So it was natural that the first Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance followed on that model, but added the, the, the point of view of the old car meet. And that was something that they did not done in Europe before the war. It was about 1966 or 67 when you began to see a real shift towards more restored older cars rather than the new cars on display. It also frankly coincided with a, a dip in the popularity of the Concours and sort of the direction of the Concours. And that continued through the late 60s and into, into the early 70s, and it really was not until 1985, I think everybody agrees, is the sort of defining moment that the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance, as we know today, came into being with, of course, the great reunion of the Bugatti Royales, when it was a contest of fashion and the manufacturers and coach builders. The coach builders and manufacturers wanted to show off their best designs and to win prizes, and it was win a prize on Sunday, sell a car on Monday, uh, very much like the old racing adage. And so it was something that people really fought to get into and to win prizes in. Even if you won second or third, the fact that your car was recognized meant a very, very big deal. So there's a process that uh, Pebble Beach goes through and they have a selection committee, then they send you a letter that uh, you have or have not been accepted to Pebble Beach. And that occurs three or four months in advance and um, it happens to many people in many cars every year. So, Winning Pebble Beach is not an easy club to join. And you don't win it until you're at the top of the ramp holding that trophy in your hand. Because there have been instances where uh, people were chosen for best to show, but you couldn't believe it, the car wouldn't start. And it wouldn't go up the ramp and they couldn't receive the award and they didn't. And so the next car in line won best of show. And that can happen. So until you're there, that's the most nerve wracking part. And I can still remember I'm sitting in line, there are four cars and one, one is chosen for best of show. And I was so nervous, I was burning the clutch. And the, the smell, I understand entirely. I know how to operate that pedal. 
but I was burning the clutch. <laughs> and my restorer was standing there with me, said, push that pedal into the floor. And it was very nerve wracking. So until you get up there and it doesn't stall and it doesn't overheat and, and you're up there and you stop and you get out of the car and you receive the award, it's not until then you've won Pebble Beach. Hi, I'm Jonathan Bueller, manager and curator of Nissan's Heritage Collection here in North America. I'm extremely excited to have you guys all join us for a tour of our collection today. Behind me is our North American headquarters here in Franklin, Tennessee, where we have a handful of our vehicles that we use for lobby displays, as well as other car events in the Middle Tennessee area. Now behind me are a few really special cars. First is our 1972 Datsun 240Z. This was a press fleet vehicle that we used uh, to promote the Z-Store restoration program back in 1996. This is a really special car for us as it's been one of the uh, key vehicles that not only do we hand off to the media but also let some of our employees drive. Additionally, behind me is one of my favorite cars. It's a 2008 pre-production auto show spec right-hand drive R35 GTR. And so with that being said, I'd like to now turn it over to our resident heritage expert, David Bishop, over at our Nissan garage at the Lane Motor Museum in Nashville, Tennessee. Dave, over to you. Hello and welcome to Nissan's Heritage Collection, located in the second level of the Lane Motor Museum in Nashville, Tennessee. We hold about 60, 65 cars here in the collection and we cover all three brands, Nissan, Datsun and Infiniti. The range goes from 1937 a 1937 Datsun Conant Roadster, all the way up to our modern cars. Not every car is in the museum today because often they're out doing public relations activities or they're out at restoration shops. But we'll go through here today and we'll focus in on some of the more significant parts of the collection. Behind me here are the three vehicles that we launched the brand with in America in the late 50s, 1959, 1960. The red pickup truck, where Datsun started the compact pickup truck market in the United States, the 1200 sedan here to the left, and the 1200 Fair Lady Roadster. They all share the same sort of mechanical uh, features, 1200 cc, 48 horsepower, uh, very simple cars of their day. If you'd like a deeper dive on the 1200 sedan, please Google Jay Leno and the Nissan Heritage Collection where you'll see Jay and I driving it on city streets in less than ideal conditions. Once the mid-60s rolled along and Nissan was selling a few thousand cars, we realized very quickly that the basic 1200 sedan wasn't large enough or fast enough for American tastes. So we introduced the 1200 series here, this coupe, and a, and a sedan that goes along with it. And this moved us along very, very rapidly. This car is interesting is that Nissan never sold this car. It was always in the collection. It was actually our brochure car in 1971 and then went on to be a technician training car at our service center in LA. The 1200 was superseded by the 510. Here you see a 510 sedan and a 510 wagon. These were extremely successful cars for Nissan in North America and a very important part of our heritage. They were a legitimate small sports sedan with independent rear suspension in the sedans and they were nicknamed at the time the poor man's BMW. They obviously went on to produce our BRE 510 Trans Am winning car which is today not in the collection, it's out doing PR duty, but uh, we're very proud of the success that Nissan had with the 510s. Next to it over there is a mid-70s um, 200 SX Coupe that is the newest addition to our collection. We just purchased that from a gentleman in Minnesota. By the time Nissan rode into the mid 70s, we had a full range of family sedans to suit the marketplace. The 510 we've already discussed, the 610, the 710, which was also available in a Coupe, and the 810 here. And I'm pointing out the 810 for a very specific reason. This is the genesis of the concept of a four-door sports car at Nissan. We took the basic 810 sedan, we extended the nose, and we added the 240Z motor with fuel injection, a five-speed transmission, and this became a true four-door sedan and one of our sports sedan legacies. No visit to the Heritage Collection would be complete without talking about the Nissan Z car. Unfortunately, there are so many Zs in this collection, we can't touch on all of them in this short video. However, we can take a close look at this one, a 1980 280ZX 
10th anniversary edition. A very rare car, and a car in this particular one that Nissan never sold. We've held on to this since day one. Today, it has 697 miles on it from new. We have people come and visit the museum and take pictures of the engine bay and take notes so that when they're restoring their own car, they can use this as a reference piece to see how the car rolled off the line when we built it new. It's a pretty cool piece of Nissan's history. Nissan has an important history in North America with compact pickup trucks. Starting in the 1960 that we pointed out earlier, all the way to the current day with the Frontier. This particular one is very special to Nissan because not only was the 720 series a very successful truck, but it was the first truck we built in America and this particular one is the very first vehicle that Nissan North America built right here in Smyrna, Tennessee. It currently has 781 miles on it and we're very proud of what we developed in Smyrna and across the country as a result of starting with just this one. Okay, there you have it. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video. Way more to show you than we can show you in just one. We hope to see you again. Have a great day. Drive safe. Forrest Jones here, and to support a great cause, I'm back with my friends at Omaze to announce your chance to win this EV converted Porsche 912 with taxes and shipping included. Now, I've reviewed some pretty amazing cars over the years, but when Omaze told me that the world famous Peterson Automotive Museum have pulled a car from their personal collection to give away to one lucky winner, I almost didn't believe it. That is until I laid eyes on this totally reimagined vintage Porsche. The Peterson team took it from the vault heavily modified it, and then the experts at Zelectric converted it to be fully electric. And if you're dying to take a closer look, that makes two of us. The vintage right exterior includes Porsche triple side stripes, custom 17-inch HRE wheels, and both classic Sibier driving lights and modern LED headlights. The interior is like a work of art with its classy houndstooth design, leather Recaro expert M seats, and a Momo Proto Tifo three-spoke steering wheel. And the original front fender fuel cap opens to reveal a modern electric charging port. Oh, and last but definitely not least, the all-electric powertrain increases its horsepower from the original 90 to an impressive 300. So what are you waiting for? Go to amaze.com slash win this Porsche and enter now for your chance to take home this one-of-a-kind, fully electric Porsche 912 with taxes and shipping included. Best of all, every donation will support the Peterson Automotive Museum and their mission to explore and present the history of the automobile and its impact on global life and culture. Thanks for donating and good luck. Hello, Peterson Museum Virtual Car Week Car Show. This is my 2005 Ford GT. You can see it is blue with white stripes, which make it look really fast. And it is just an all around cool car. I bought this car from the original owner. It's been in California its entire life. I've had it about three years now. And it's just a really special car to me and it's incredibly fast. And I have every little piece of documentation going back to when it was a brand new car, including the original window sticker, which was a sticker price of like $149,995 or something like that right in there. These cars have gone up in value a little bit since then because they are just so special and so unique. But I love this car and I always have. I've, I've had it, like I said, for about three years and it was a really special car to me. I'm not really into a lot of supercars, at least in order to, to own personally, but I really wanted this one. It was it's just such an iconic shape, and I really think it's one of the least expensive, like truly iconic cars that you can buy. Ford made about 4,000 of these for two model years, 05 and 06, and I'm thrilled that I have number 1456 from 05. It's a very, very special and exciting car. And it is incredibly fast, as you can imagine. The supercharged V8 has enormous power, and this one is tuned for even more enormous power. And I'm always terrified that I'm gonna have in some sort of trouble with the law driving this car because it's almost impossible not to drive it really fast. Obviously, six-speed manual transmission. It comes from that era in the mid-2000s where cars were just still kind of analog before screens and everything took over, and it has that kind of analog supercar feel. It's a really special car to me, uh, one of my very favorite cars that I've ever owned, and I'm, I'm thrilled to have it. And so that is my Ford GT, and thank you for watching me, and I love the Peterson Museum. Thank you for letting me uh, appear in the virtual car concours. Hey, what's up? I'm Nolan, and this is my 1952 Crown Imperial. I bought this car back in May of 2020. I've been having a lot of fun. 
uh, getting it back to roadworthy shape. It's got the 331 Firepower Chrysler Hemi in it, the first Hemi that Chrysler put into a production car. I'm a huge fan of Mopar products, and for a few years I've wanted to own a Firepower car, and when I saw this thing pop up online, I knew I had to have it. I love the patina, I love the shape of this car, I love the engine. The interior is in really great condition as well. It's full of boxes, full of parts right now, so I don't know if you want to see that. Um, this car's body is in really great condition. There's only a few spots of serious rust. Everything else is straight. There's very little dents in this car. My plan is just to get it going, get it running, get it out on the road, let people see a car from 1952. I think that's really cool. I think people really appreciate old cars when they see them out on the road, and driving them is just such a different experience from cars today. A carbureted car, has so much more feeling than something fuel injected with power steering and power brakes. This car actually did come with power steering and power brakes. I'm not sure if they'll work though. <laughs> I actually, I took the brake booster out and now it's just got manual brakes. I will, I plan on installing that back in at some point. I do have some other major modifications in mind down the road once it is running. I think an airbag suspension system would be very cool. Get this thing super low to the ground. That'd be awesome. Of course, modern brakes. This thing has drum brakes on all four corners. I anticipate it's going to be a little dicey driving a, I think, 5,200 pound car around with just manual drum brakes. That's going to be a bit of an adventure. So some disc brakes would be really awesome. Started the conversion process from a six volt to a 12 volt electrical system. Uh, and I, I plan on keeping this car for a, a good amount of time. It's really unique. And I think people are going to love seeing it on the road. There is a bit of a, there, there's a bit of a trend now with uh, patinaed cars like mine slammed on airbag suspension with big wheels. I'm not sure I want to go with the steel wheel look. Everybody else kind of does that. I am looking towards the JDM scene for wheel inspiration. Growing up, I was primarily only exposed to muscle cars and street rods. Anything before 1975, that was all I was into as a younger man. Now that I've moved down to LA and worked at Donut Media for a few years, I've been exposed to a lot of different scenes, like the lowrider scene here in LA and the import scene through Donut. And I kind of want to bring some touches from those scenes onto this car. I'm not exactly sure how I'll pull that off and uh, actually make it work, but I'm, I'm still thinking about it. I don't want this to just be exclusively a street rod. I don't want it to just be, you know, like an old 50s cars. I want it to have touches from a lot of my, a lot of scenes that I'm into. I'm Nolan from Donut Media, and this has been my 1952 Crown Imperial. Hi, I'm Manny Koshman, avid car collector, and Peterson Museum was gracious to bring us the EB110 to show us the old and the new. And here we got my one-off Chiron Hermes edition. This is uh, one of my best in my collection. I love this car because it's all designed by Hermes and Bugatti, two French companies that do the top-notch work each to their own and you can take a look inside it's got a really cool one-off fabric all the design of the seats is one-off and it comes with its own Hermes back collection and really cool let me pop the front and show you and voila here's the back it comes even with the driving gloves matching to the interior leather and comes with a really cool plaque here. That's probably the coolest part of the car. It's uh, in French, it says dressed by Hermes and it's got a one of one badge. And even up here is nicely finished in a matching color suede. And a one off grill etch for Hermes. All right, do you guys want to hear the engine? Let's fire it up. plugs to drive a Bugatti Chiron. Well, thanks for watching. Be safe, be well. See you guys soon. Good morning from the Peterson. We brought with us today a 1964 Comet Caliente from the East African Safari 1964. Mercury um, had a performance division and they were interested in proving to the world that this was a world beater car. 
So they entered what they called was the world's toughest road rally, 3,100 miles of dirt roads in Africa over two days. Car was modified with a roll bar, obviously the Bilstrop influenced paint job, um, steel wheels, V8, high performance engine. Uh, Bilstrop just down the freeway here in Long Beach was responsible for building these cars. The cars were either flown or put on a ship to Africa where they competed in April of 1964. Um, this car is a tribute to my father-in-law, Ray Brock, who was the technical editor and publisher of Hot Rod Magazine for many years. And um, they paired him up with a, a local co-driver who knew the roads. They went, he went over, uh, spent Easter there, practiced for a month in these cars, and then they had the actual race. Um, mud, rain, wild animals in the way. Uh, it does have a, a horn that's equipped for the, the co-pilot and the driver to scare animals away that, that might be in the road. Uh, it was very effective. As we look around the back, you'll see the handles on the trunk. These handles were functional uh, in the mud. And if there was no traction or low traction situation, the co-pilot would get out and use these bumpers, bumper steps and grab on and put traction on the wheel, depending on which wheel was slipping, help them get through the muddy section. Uh, mud flaps were required, uh, auxiliary lighting in the front, um, air, aircraft landing lights on the high beams. And then on the inside, they had two thermoses mounted, which was their food for the trip, basically, because they didn't stop. They drove day and night. Um, map light for the co-pilot, racing seats, racing harness. Uh, originally, they had a tire in the back seat, extra large gas tank, hood pins front and rear. It has a, a um, Swedish-made, analog rally computer that was helpful in, in determining their speed and, and, and how they were doing in the, in the rally. Um, but the, the driver, Ray Brock, did win a, a trophy for the highest finishing American driver in the 1964 East African rally. In 1944, on sea France. After years of occupation, the Nazis have been pushed out of the country and the city is in celebration. And what do people see at the head of the victory parade? A French car wearing French coachwork, driven by a young French industrialist and member of the French resistance. It was freedom embodied and a celebrated shove off to the Nazis. I'm Philip here at Hyman Limited in St. Louis, and this is a 37 Delahaye 135 Supreme Roadster. The Type 135 was unveiled at the Paris Auto Salon in 1935, marking Delahaye's triumphant return to racing. 135s went on to achieve remarkable results at Monte Carlo, Emil Emilia, Le Mans, but perhaps most famously, the Alpine Rally. This is on the upgraded Coupe des Alpes spec chassis, and this sporty body was made by Carrossier Henry Saprone. It's one of just seven of these amazing roadsters ever made. In 1937, a Frenchman named Cyril de Perry bought this Delahaye new. Five years later, the occupying forces came into his hometown, and he literally had to hide this Delahaye away from the Nazis. Since then, this car has only had three additional owners. It has documentation from new, it's undergone a world-class restoration, and in 2016, this car won its class at the Pebble Beach Concord of Elegance. Hi, uh, welcome to my car. This is uh, my 1935 Auburn Boat Tail Speedster, and um, it's a hot rod, has some wonderful features, like this little door here is to put your golf clubs in if you're a golfer. Nice engine in it. It has a 5.7 liter engine, supercharged. It's all polished, very nice. Knockoff wheels on it. And it took me about, oh, 13, 14 years to uh, get it to this level. Um, I bought the car many years ago and it was yellow. And one day I decided to paint it silver and black. It shoots flames out the tailpipes, about three foot flames, so I could roast marshmallows whenever I want. 
and uh, has uh, automatic cutouts, so it can be quiet like a Cadillac or loud like a race car. And it has a um, sound system in it with a subwoofer and amplifier, and it was just in a music video for uh, City Girls by Chris Brown. And it's uh, had miles of smiles driving it. The rear end is it comes to a point if you want to come over here with the camera so you could see the, the back end is kind of nice. And then it has a raked windshield, kind of like a Duval style windshield. Of all the cars I've ever seen, I think this is one of the more um, dramatic and spectacular. I saw it uh, many years ago. I saw one in Pomona, a white one, and uh, I stood next to it. This is actually quite a large car. I have stood next to an MG and a Corvette and other kind of sports cars. And this is quite uh, dramatic and big and massive. I almost feel like you're, if you're driving it, you're like a movie star or royalty or uh, it's kind of bigger than life. And that's the, the fun of it. I drive it to the beach almost every weekend. I got my beach chairs in the back with my beach blanket and it's a good way to go in style. The front of it has a hood ornament that's a, a, a Greek goddess, a flying lady. And uh, I'm a magician hobbyist, so I named the car Mystique. And it's been uh, up to the Magic Castle many a day with uh, some famous magicians that uh, have uh, enjoyed it. I just try to drive it a lot. Always, always try to keep it on the road going. Sometimes I go to the supermarket and sometimes I go on car rallies and wherever I can drive it, I like to. I want to thank the Peterson Museum for taking time to video it. Thank you very much for uh, your interest in watching it. Hey, I'm Matt Winter. This is my daughter, Scout Winter. This is our 1957 Porsche Speedster, all original California car. This car uh, we acquired from the uh, second owner of the vehicle. Um, it was with him for 60 plus years. And when he passed away, um, they uh, decided to sell the vehicle, the family, and we were lucky enough to acquire the car. It's a 100% um, all matching numbers car, all original body panels, complete um, beautiful example of a 1957 and a half Speedster uh, with a um, very unique paint job done by uh, Angelo Pino, who was a master of his trade quite obviously, all leaded gaps and full restoration done, almost 20 plus year restoration. The car is um, absolutely stunning. It's got a 1700 um, big bore in it, 1720 I believe, big bore kit. And um, the car is phenomenal, runs and drives beautifully. It was upgraded with uh, an SC disc brake system which will eventually go back to its original. Um, we have the original uh, drums and wheels and everything is actually in process of restoration as well. And uh, we're gonna get swapping on that pretty soon. This car is fitted with a 100% original glass par hardtop um, with, uh, within respects to rubbers that were redone. The glass par hardtop was a uh, aftermarket product in the 50s that was made uh, in California for this vehicle um, and uh, we were lucky enough to score one for the car. We've had a lot of people tell us that uh, fitting original glass parts is almost impossible but lucky enough for us we found this one in mint condition but also in identical matching red. The top was not painted if you believe that and uh, yeah it's an incredible piece. I'll open the car door here for you guys, you can see. This car was owned by one gentleman who initially bought it to race the car. Uh, he did some rallies and racing, but he never actually put it on the track. So it remained uncrashed, which is great. All original seats, all original instrument panels, steering wheel, original keys. We'll pop the trunk so you guys can take a look at the motor. Scout will help me. You wanna go ahead and pop it? Lift it from the grill. Yeah. 
Line up, ready? The motor was originally uh, rebuilt by Adrian Gant years ago, who's a very famous uh, engine rebuilder. The car is quite quick. Um, right, Scout? Mm -hmm. The fast? Uh, we have a 64 Super Carrera as well, and it's, yeah, you can put it down. It's identical color red. The car was originally ivory with red interior, which uh, eventually one day might go back as well. But as of right now, in its immaculate state, we're just caring for the car, driving it as much as possible, right? Mm -hmm. This car is an original Max Hoffman vehicle. It was originally shipped to Max Hoffman in the mid of 57, 6 of 57. Um, which makes it kind of a T1, T2 transition. The car is fitted with all its original 57 and a half, if you will, almost 58 parts with the teardrop tail lights. And it's got the US override bumper guards. Um, the car is very special uh, because it's got all of its original Max Hoffman paperwork. I have the uh, incredibly impeccable condition Max Hoffman sales slips and dealer paid in full tags. We even have the Lockheed paperwork for when it was brought over. Um, it's incredible to have a car like this with such provenance and and real history. Being a California native myself, there's just so few of these cars around, especially, you know, cars with good stories instead of, you know, horror stories. Um, these cars were meant to race. So, you know, back in the day, guys bought them, raced them, trashed them. And then, you know, we have guys that are really good at restoring them to make it look like there was no damage. But we have all the original photos of this car stripped to bare metal, which shows its impeccable condition um, from day one. We even have some really cool things like original spare keys, driving gloves, things like that, that, you know, have been with the car for decades. And now we're lucky enough to take care of it. So thank you so much for allowing us to bring this and share it with you guys. This is a absolute prize to our family and will be for many years to come, right? Mm -hmm. Never gonna sell it? No. Even after I die? <laughs> Oh, there was some hesitation there. <laughs> Edit, <laughs> cut. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I hope you uh, appreciate and enjoy the car as much as we do. Hi, I'm Joe Hurwich, and this is my 1954 Alfa Romeo C Super Sprint. It's the first Alfa made on a production line, the first Alfa made with left-hand drive, and the first Alfa without a separate chassis. There were 949 examples of these made by various body and coach builders, minus by Touring. This Alpha is powered by 1974 CC inline four cylinder motor. <clears throat> it has its original motor and transmission, including the very unusual five speed column shifter. This Alpha was completely restored in Germany in 2012. Back to its original colors of the dark blue and the blue interior. As I said, the car was in Germany most of its life, has had only five owners since new. Let's take a look at the interior now. <clears throat> Interesting is these window winders, the great beehives at the end, and the big steering wheel, um, all of the gauges in place, and that great five-speed column shifter, one of very few ever made. Going farther over to the center, you see that it has an ashtray and a cigarette lighter. It's Italian, what do you expect? And its original Blaupunk radio. Going to the back area, you see it's got these interesting aluminum spears along the bottom and the back, presumably for luggage so you wouldn't damage the interior.
I love the lines and the styling, and I buy cars with my eyes. And this was love at first sight. Still one of my favorites. Thank you very much. I'm Joe Hurwich, and this is my 1954 Alpha 1900. So my name is Catherine Sutton and this is my 1964 Porsche 356C that I actually affectionately refer to as the Egg. Um, I've had her since 2005. She's in a fabulous, fabulous fun car to drive. And some of the more interesting things about the car in terms of its setup is original in many ways other than as you can see it's got the uh, 1971 Deep Six Fuchs wheels. Those were added to the car by the gentleman that it came from. Um, he did a full restoration of the car in the late 70s, ground up, I have all the photographs, so it's a, fun, it's a fun journey to look at. And at that time, I'm guessing, is when he made the decision to change the wheels. He also added a racing exhaust. He put on, as well at that time, a big ball kit to the, on the engine, and he also um, included a, a, an absolutely beautiful billet aluminium deeper oil sump cover which unfortunately I cracked during a Targa California a couple of years ago so I still have it it's a great piece of automotive jewelry now in the garage um, she's a fantastic car to drive I'm really lucky I take her on at least two rallies a year so I've done something called the Copper State Thousand which is an Arizona based rally and I've been running in that one since 2012 um, I also go on the Targa California, which is a, which is a more local based, but just as much fun in terms of road event to do. Um, and plus we have such wonderful roads in, in LA anyway, that there's a great group of people that I get to, to run out and, and drive with on many occasions. But in terms of other things that are interesting about the car, what can I tell you? She has a nice collection of, of automotive flair on the back. Um, my personalized plate HRA. So she has a nice collection of automotive flair on the back. So I've got a few badges, um, combination of events that I've done and also uh, two throwbacks in particular to my English heritage. So I have an AA badge and an RAC badge. And those are both two of the um, English equivalents of AAA. So the Royal Automobile Club and AA were two, two car um, services that you would have if you owned a vehicle back in the UK so if you broke down one or other of those would come and rescue you so I thought that was quite fun when I found them on eBay. Um, we have a personalized number plate HRH 356C uh, again a bit of a lean towards the English um, HRH standing for Her Royal Highness. Um, original color uh, although unfortunately I've had a couple of incidences um, not of my own cho choosing one was with a taxi driver and the front of the car lost so we had to do a re bit of a repaint I have a fabulous mechanic, so he and I like to work out things that we can do that actually really constantly making differences to the car, more from a, a practical standpoint in terms of drivability. So that's why I have the additional lights at the front, and I've also had the, um, the guards put on the, the, the um, front headlights. The other thing that I did, um, or he did for me, I should say, is we changed out the, um, the windshield wiper system. So the original windshield wiper system for this car was a, was a foot pump that really was not that effective. And when you're driving long distance, and you know, especially with, with the weather can be a little bit more inclement at certain months, the option to improve that was really straightforward from, from his perspective. So what we've put into the car is a 912 electric windshield wiper system, which makes a huge difference. Um, what else can I tell you? Many happy miles, I think that's the most important thing. Many, many happy miles. I've had the car, as I say, since 2005. And I really, I look at her as part of my family. You know, in some ways, she's may even be my best friend. She's been through a lot with me, which I, some good, not, not some, not necessarily, some good, <laughs> some not so good situations, but she's always been a great way to get me um, focused and back out on the road and keep me enjoying 
life and heading forward. I think that's one of the most important things with her. This is Teelbird. Teelbird is a 1961 Thunderbird custom concept. The idea behind Teelbird was to take an already amazing personal luxury car and make it even more special. I'm the owner, Barry Penfound, and as the seventh Penfound design custom, Teelbird uses old school scallops and stance combined with 21st century touches like one-off Penfound design, Hot Rods by Boyd, 19 inch wheels, unique PPG paint, and a luxurious interior with its wonderful swing away steering wheel, anodized blue trim, and color keyed upholstery. A Teelbird highlight and its most talked about feature is a trunk that includes 1950s era Samsonite luggage with travel stickers for the fantasy places the car might have visited. Teelbird has been well received by spectators, showgoers, and judges and has received several first place awards, the highlight being the Good Guys Boyd Coddington Memorial Award. I think Boyd would have been pleased with Teelbird's style. Perhaps the best part about Teelbird is that it enjoys being driven, gets great looks, and reminds us of an era that hopefully will never be gone. Hi, my name is Dwayne. This is my 1929 Model A Roadster that's been in our family for about 70 years and it was restored by Uncle Harold 70 years ago when he got back from Korea. Uh, this, we're really proud to have it and I've been the caretaker of this car for 12 years. It went from my Uncle Harold to his brother Larry and uh, after Larry passed away she, uh, uh, Aunt Sherry asked if I would take over the car so I would been a, it's been a joy for me. It's the first old car I've ever owned before. And I do all the work myself, and uh, it's just, it's been a lot of work getting it back in shape, but uh, it's running very well now, and it's, it's a pleasure to get it out on the road. So I'm driving this car a few times a week, and it's fun getting it out in public because people rarely see old cars in the wild, so I'm glad to do it. This is basically stock as it was restored 70 years ago. We had to do the front seats that were rotten from the sun. I had to rewire the car, but generally, uh, and the, the paint, pinstriping, wheels, top, and rumble seat are all from 70 years ago. Under the hood, there's one thing that makes this car unique is it has a 1929 aftermarket part, which is called the Otwell Health Heater. And it takes the standard exhaust manifold, it uh, casts an air intake, and it just passively heats up through the exhaust gases and passes air through. And so on a cold winter day, I can get heat in, keep my feet and legs warm. This car has four wheel mechanical brakes, three speed non synchronous transmission, and um, you have to adjust everything manually. It does no thinking for you. You have to adjust the spark, the fuel mixture based upon road conditions, and uh, you have to double clutch when you shift, which means you, between each gear, you pause in neutral, disengage the clutch, re-engage the clutch, and back to the next gear. That's the only way you can shift without grinding. So that's, uh, that's basically it. Uh, this, the, in, in 1929, this car cost $400. The rumble seat was extra. You could either have a trunk or a rumble seat. And then I added, added the luggage rack for traveling. I'll put a trunk there so I can go long distances and keep luggage because there's not a lot of room in the rumble seat. Uh, this lever is the spark advance and retard, so this is in the fully retarded position, fully advanced. So uh, after the car, I start the car fully retarded, I put it down about halfway for normal driving. For high-speed driving, I'll advance the spark about two-thirds down. 
and for going up long hills under load, I'll retard the spark just to get a little, bo little bit more power. This is a throttle level, a throttle, throttle lever, which is connected to the throttle pedal down there. And it just allows me to control the throttle while I start the car. Because the starter button is way up there by the steering column. This is your horn, and this is the light control with parking, headlights, and high beams. And the horn. And the instrumentation is very basic. There's an ammeter, a fuel level gauge, which is nothing more than a, a steel rod that goes into the cowl ta gas tank. And there's a cork on the end of it that floats up and down and lets you know what your, there's a little sight glass here that tells you what your fuel level is. And you actually see the fuel in the little opening. So the instrumentation is a speedometer, ammeter, a trip meter, and then in period after market, my uncle added uh, oil, oil pressure and uh, water temperature gauge just for extra information. This is a, about a 1917 Boyce motometer, and it measures the air temperature above the coolant and from the passenger co compartment. You can see the thermometer, and so you can tell relatively how hot your engine's running by how high up the red is getting. And there's a little circle up there, and if you see the red in the circle, you've got to shut down your car, <laughs> then you're in trouble. But that's, uh, that's basically it. So, uh, well, it's been, oh, go ahead. it's been a pleasure bringing my car here today, and I was happy to share it with you. And I hope when you see me out on the road of lo streets of Los Angeles, just honk and wave, and I'll honk back. I'm Jeff Lane, director of Lane Motor Museum, and this is a 1954 Devon Panhard. And so this was one of the very first cars that Bill Devon built. Bill Devon was a guy from California. He was actually a Plymouth dealer. Uh, he raced Ferraris. And then he, he was one of the very early people that built fiberglass bodies. And he saw a Panhard Dyna, and he liked the drivetrain. He liked the front engine, the front wheel drive, the two cylinder boxer motor. And he decided to do an aerodynamic body and use the motor. So the body's very, as you can see, was super, super aerodynamic and slippery. Uh, this is a 750cc car, so it was built as a race car. It raced in 1955 and 1956 and got on the podium several times. But not only did he do a, a very aerodynamic body, but he also did an overhead camshaft conversion for the engine, which made it typically the Panhard 750 was about 35 horsepower. And when he did the overhead cam and other modifications, the horsepower increased to somewhere between 70 and 80 horsepower. So it made the car very fast, very aerodynamic. And of course, as you can see, very basic, although it had headlights, um, it has one door on this side, um, but it does not <clears throat> have a door on that side. So for structural integrity, he just had the one door on this side. The, the whole uh, front of the car tips up like this. So you can expose to the engine. Again, it's front wheel drive. Um, and it's so very light, very aerodynamic, good power to weight ratio. My name is Joseph Salvo and my wife Shella and I own this 1967 Porsche 911 S soft window Targa. Some unique features to this car, uh, 1967 was the first year of the S class for Porsche and the 911s. 1967 was also the first year of the Targa top replacing the 356 convertible. Uh, very few were built, this is one of 483. Unique to this car is that it was actually purchased and driven for two years by the first Porsche dealer in Orange County, Chick Iverson. Chick sold it to the gentleman that we were able to purchase it from in August of 2017. We purchased it with all of the documentation, the original paperwork, uh, even the gentleman's finance docs, and it subsequently went through a 24-month nut and bolt frame-off restoration by Car Park in Costa Mesa. Nothing was left untouched. Every part, every nut, every bolt was restored to as original factory condition. 
and that's the condition that you see it in today. Greetings from the mountains of northern New Mexico and welcome to the less ordinary world of Land Rovers. My name is Louis Straining. I'm very pleased to introduce you to Rhino, my 1965 Land Rover Series 2A. It's described as an 88-inch station wagon. Rhino is powered by a 77 brake horsepower four-cylinder petrol engine. The original transmission is equipped with four forward gears, a ferry overdrive assisted by Warren hubs. This truck only has 11,500 miles on all components. Climb aboard. With seating for seven, there's plenty of room for you and your next adventure. proud owner of this 1939 Bentley four and a quarter liter Van Voren pillarless saloon. This car was one of the last 200 produced by Bentley, which were all overdrive cars, M series overdrive cars. Some of the differences with the overdrive cars were obviously the namesake overdrive transmission. It had a higher gear ratio, 17 inch wheels, Marl's roller and cam steering, uh, bypass filter, and a bunch of other little tiny tweaks that made the car just that much better than the standard car. One of the things that makes it a much more enjoy enjoyable driver is that the car was guaranteed to go 85 miles an hour continuously, while the standard car was only uh, guaranteed to 75 miles an hour. This was, this particular Bentley, bodied by Van Voren was one of just seven overdrive cars that were ever bo bodied by Van Voren. This is the only overdrive car that's known to have survived that was bodied by Van Voren. It was also the last car bodied by Van Voren and the last Bentley bodied by them. An interesting kind of side note is the car was also in the shop being bodied by Van Voren at the same time, as far as I can tell, as the Shah of Iran's uh, Bugatti that the Peterson Museum has. Um, some of the unique features that drew me to this car are the exaggerated compound curves in the fenders with the kind of extra pointy fenders which is a very rare unique feature in a car like this. Um, also the windshield is slanted back at a much more rakish angle than a standard Bentley bodied car would have been. Um, also, in its namesake being a pillarless saloon, there is no B-pillar, which is a really fascinating feature, along with it having all the, all the wood is covered in leather, whereas normally Bentleys would have a, a book-matched interior of wood. The, the covering of the leather is actually a very French thing in most of the French-bodied cars, whether they're Bugattis, Hispano Suezas, etc had that feature. The door panel is actually very similar to the Bugatti door panels and same with the seat which has this metal frame which extends down below. One of the main things that drew me to this car besides those unique features was this beautiful French blue which is also a very rare car color on a Bentley. Uh, it's kind of a very French color, and the name is obviously French blue, so it kind of goes along with the territory. Uh, Bugattis and other French cars were more often seen in this color. 
The original owner of this car was Lily Bollinger of the Bollinger Champagne House. She, got, she uh, purchased the car about three to four months before the Nazis overtook her winery. She then, right before they got there, she decided, I want to save the Bentley. So she took it down into the cellars, bricked it up, and concealed it from them. Then she went on to provide about 178,000 bottles of champagne to the Nazis in order to protect her winery and to protect her employees from going to the prison camps. Towards the end of the war, uh, let me s s go back into this. Um, at night, she would often sleep in the cellars down next to her Bentley, which was kind of one of her prized possessions that she wanted to keep a close eye on. And it survived a second close call when uh, the Nazis were going to booby trap and dynamite the cellars along with the Bentley. But General Patton's army arrived just in time to save the car. After the war, she disinterred the vehicle from the cellars kept it for a number of years until eventually fell into the hands of the British Council to Beer Ritz, who kept it for a number of years. And eventually, the car actually became into the ownership of Jules Human, who was the co-chairman of the Pebble Beach Concourse. Um, I've really enjoyed this car, and I've driven it quite often. It, I've driven it about 3,000 miles since I've had it. I've had it maybe five years. And, uh, one of the highlights for me with this car was it was accepted into the 2019 Pebble Beach Concorde d'Elegance, which was a 100-year celebration of Bentley. And it was a real privilege and honor to be involved in that and take place in that. And the tour was one of the highlights of all of my automotive experiences and driving experiences. And uh, that's about it. I hope you enjoyed the car. And... Happy motoring. My name is Sean Salehian, and this is my 1937 Studebaker Coupe Express. It uh, has a supercharged 289 motor from a GT Hawk with a McCulloch supercharger on it. And the whole thing is on air suspension. Uh, it was a five-year build, and I'll show you guys around the truck. So this was, um, Studebaker made a coupe version of this, and the there was a need for a truck, so they basically had the front end of this with a modified cab and they turned it into a pickup truck. Uh, so that's why it's called a Coupe Express because it was made for deliveries. Uh, the one thing that I really liked about this truck when I first saw it was the side mount tire. It just really stood out to me. I thought it was really beautiful. And um, looking around the car, it has a uh, handmade walnut bed. Uh, the tailgate is custom. The running boards have been smoothed out. There's a custom roll pan in the back and the rear glass is modified. Um, the car has artillery wheels from a 37 Plymouth. Um, these were not the stock Studebaker wheels, but I wanted to keep the white wall tires on there because I thought it was a pretty unique, you know, look to the period. I didn't want to go, I don't want to go too rest -a -mod. I wanted it to look original, but also have uh, modern components on it. So all the frame has been modified to accommodate air suspension. It's got a four link rear suspension on it. Um, the transmission is a T10 from the married motor, which was the 289 from a 64 Studebaker. And the interior was all custom built by Rex Copeman. The body paint, all the fabrication work was done by Nick Battaglia at Loose Cannon Customs. And the rest of the work I did myself uh, in my home garage. So this was a somewhat of a, somewhat of a garage build, um, doing all the wiring and final assembly and everything. So. Um, it was a labor of love. It took, took a long time. It took a lot of resources and a lot of friendly people to get parts and advice from. But all in all, this is, uh, this is the finished project and I'm really proud of it.
I'll, uh, I'll bring you to the interior so you can take a look. So this is <coughs> custom dyed leather. Um, I got the leather I wanted and sent it to a factory actually here in Los Angeles that dyed the leather for me. Everything in the interior is custom. The dashboard is actually from a 37 Packard. Um, the Studebaker and Packard merged at one point, so I kept it somewhat in the family, considering that the gauge cluster is not original to a Studebaker. The steering wheel um, is a tilt column with a 41 Lincoln Zephyr steering wheel on it. And the uh, upholstery is all, it's a custom pattern. This was not stock or not original looking, but the door panel pockets are similar to a Porsche 356. And um, all of the wood grain that you see here, the dashboard and the window trim bezels were all hand painted by Nick Battaglia. If you actually come in here and get a shot of the headliner, this thing has a full stereo system in it, but there is no head unit. So it's actually connected to a Bluetooth controller. So the second I turn the car on, it's automatically connected to my phone. So that center pod is a speaker and the ones on the outside are speakers too. But that middle speaker actually was a Studebaker factory accessory from 1937. So you could actually add that to your car if you wanted to install a radio. And then one of the kind of unique touches that I really, really like about this truck that sets it off is just small badges like this. If you notice on this side in the taillight, um, I added this little emblem right here. It was a reproduction. And then the, um, the license plate registration topper. So I actually had this license plate made, don't tell anybody. But this topper actually, if you see it where my registration is stamped in, that was a lapel pin from the Studebaker factory. Uh, some guy had 500 of them for sale on eBay and I only wanted one of them. He said, if you wanna buy it, you have to buy the whole lot. So I have 499 of them left if anybody wants one. So one unique feature is actually how this hood opens. It is attached to the hood ornament itself. So if you twist that and you can open the hood. And a lot of people ask me what this rod is for. He actually just asked me, it's a hood prop. So this was a lot of motor in a very small space. The original motor was a straight six um, with probably 60 or 70 horsepower. So now we're pushing probably about 380 out of a, uh, a supercharged 289 that's been completely gone through and modified. The supercharger is a McCulloch supercharger, which was actually a, a fact, Studebaker offered that as a uh, factory supercharger on a lot of their cars in the 50s and 60s. Uh, the Golden Hawk was the, the, you know, the moniker of that car. A 57 Golden Hawk had that same supercharger and then a 64 GT Hawk is actually where I got this engine out of. Thank you guys for viewing my car and letting me share it with you. I hope you enjoyed looking at it as much as I enjoyed uh, the process of restoring it. And hopefully you'll see me uh, again soon at a show or somewhere near you. I was one of those guys, totally, totally against electric cars. All that's changed. The power, the performance, you cannot deny it in these cars. Carol always said, I didn't live in the past. He always said, the next car is his best. Proud to introduce the Superformance MK3E. Hi, I'm Elaine Bendell, and I would like to introduce you to this beautiful 1964 Lincoln Continental convertible. Just 3,300 convertibles were built by Lincoln that year. 
The most unusual aspect of this car is its rare external color, buckskin. Lincoln offered 20 colors in 64, but just one month after this car was built in October 63, Lincoln canceled buckskin. As a result, not more than 40 buckskin convertibles were ever built new and only a handful survive. In fact, this is the only one I am aware of that has a buckskin exterior, palomino interior, pleated leather seats with buttons, and a beautiful original carpet in as delivered condition. The engine is the original 430 cubic inch V8 with 320 horsepower. After five decades, it still looks and runs great. This car was state-of-the-art back in 64 with its automated convertible top system running on a complex series of switches, motors, and relays. Mine works, but my car guy says this is the most complicated American car ever built. I believe him. But enough talk. It's time to take her for a spin. Hello, this is George Garrett, and I'm from Huntington Beach, California. This is my 1939 Ford Deluxe Coupe. I've owned it uh, 25 years, uh, restored it when I first got it, and uh, have driven it all over the country, across the, uh, across the USA on the Lincoln Highway. Been down to the uh, Texas area once and drove it up to the Oregon area twice. Got a flathead V8, runs great. Hello. My name is Murray Paff. I'm from Royal Oak, Michigan, and I'd like to introduce you to my 1959 Imperial Speedster. This car was built in a two and a half car garage by 10 buddies, every one of them a volunteer, over the course of 10,000 documented man hours and four and a half years. We took a 1959 Imperial four door sedan and cut it into 46 major pieces. Uh, we shortened the car in five different areas for a total of four feet, three inches. We then sectioned the car three inches, and then we narrowed the car eight inches and channeled it as well over the top of a Schwartz G machine chassis, a total of five inches. It features a 6.1 Hemi, has a Dodge Viper independent rear suspension, We'll give you a peek of what was done under the hood here. There is the 6.1 Hemi, complete with its Hemi style valve covers, which took over 120 hours alone to fabricate. The intake manifold was turned 180 degrees on the engine so that the throttle body was hidden in a special compartment fed by the cowl vent to make up the air. The front nose cone is a 57 Chevy bumper bullet with a custom CNC machined fin bullet to match the taillights to kind of make that look like a faux intake. This car is a two seat speedster, really a nod to the two seat sports car that Chrysler never built until they came out with the Dodge Viper in 1991. This was a what if to a gentleman's GT to compete against Corvette and Thunderbird in the late 50s. It features all Imperial design elements. They've just been rearranged and massaged. These dash clusters came out of a 1960 Imperial, just simply because I like the bullet shapes. We'll start the car up for you. Contains all the push button features, including transmission selector. Full leather interior with plaid inserts. The car has driven from New York to Naples, Charlotte to Beverly Hills. It's driven in LA rush hour traffic over the potholed streets of Detroit. I've autocrossed it, I've drag raced it, and it's completed two hot rod power tours. 
I have currently over 7,000 miles on this car that I've put on it in the past 10 years that it's been on the road. I appreciate the opportunity to show it to you and I hope you enjoyed it. Hello, my name is Mark Lopez and this is our 1966 Shelby GT350, the serial number SFM 6S289. It was delivered to its original owner, Competition Press and Auto Week magazine in the Shelby American Trailer, November 5th, 1965. My parents bought this car in August 67 for $2,600. It's been in the family now for over 53 years. 28 of those years, it's spent in our garage just sitting there from 1977 to 2005. Mom signed the car over to me in 2005 and we did the restoration to the car that you see today. It retains many of its original components, the drivetrain, including matching numbers engine. It's got the original Coney's rebuilt by Coney, stamped July 65, the original Krager wheels, including the fifth one in the trunk, the original seat covers, including the hump there that I sat on when I was seven years old when my parents test drove this car in 67, original Ray Brown racing seat belts, the original tack, still functional, and um, it's signed by Carol Shelby, Bob Bondurant, Chuck Cantwell, and Peter Brock. Unique items on this car include the in-dash Blaupunt AM FM Marine Band Radio, the under-dash Blaupunt Marine Band Radio, and also the electric antenna, all styled by Carol Shelby for his buddy Russ Gobel prior to delivery. It's one of five 66s that did not go through a dealer or go to a Shelby associate. To see more on the history of our family car, visit our site at 66gt350.com. Thank you.